I would like to talk to you a little bit about uh, Donna or sacrifice and poverty and uh, our, I guess we really should call it a monk's class, but in our training class, which you are now holding during the winter training before uh, we have our service, we were looking at the Lotus Sutra, but we didn't get very close to it today. We were talking about some other stuff. Uh, and so we were, went all over the place, and I thought maybe we, I could recap that. Um, we were talking uh, about a little book in the beginning uh, that monks in Vietnam were given. And um, I've been trying to get an English translation for years of this book and uh, had very little success with it because uh, it just is, it's a, it would be a lot of work for someone to translate for one thing. I don't know about the economic value of it after it got translated. But once again, I ran into a thing where um, a lady said to me, oh, I think uh, Hein Yat Han, uh, he has that book at uh, Deer Park. And I was told that 10, uh, 15, 20 years ago. And so uh, the book's called Stepping Into Freedom. And uh, it is um, a loose translation of the little book that we're, that's given the monks. Uh, there's actually quite a bit missing from it, but that's okay. Uh, but it's got pieces of stuff that were in there. And so uh, in my journey to, to, to see this, first to try to get a phone number to call Deer Park to see if they had the little book, which I was told, Stepping Into Freedom, and then we have one copy in our library. And so I looked at it and I went, oh, okay, yeah, it's got, it's got some of the stuff out of the little book. Uh, I was looking at uh, the requirements for the group that is centered around uh, Watum Nyat Han and uh, what he requires of monks. And this began our conversation. And our conversation was uh, uh, about this, and I'll, I'll get to poverty and I'll get to sacrifice as I go along here. But uh, one of his requirements was for people that wanted to be a novice is that, first of all, they had to move into Deer Park. Uh, contrary to uh, what's popular in American Buddhism, if there should be such a thing, but at least what's commonly practiced here is people are not, uh, they have to leave home, which is a traditional Buddhist practice of leaving their home and moving into the temple or the monastery. Well, that's expected. And uh, what was interesting was that they could not have any contact with the, their family or their friends for two years. And uh, I had a monk here many years ago, Bodhi, he's on our memorial altar. Uh, the reason he came to me is because <laughs> he didn't want to give up all contact with his family and friends for two years. And, um, but I certainly understand uh, why Tai Nyan Han would make a requirement like that. Having trained a couple of Americans and seen the problems that can arise as we have a difficulty letting go of our attachments and our uh, really comfort. It isn't so much the attachment, it's the comfort that comes with uh, keeping up those relationships. And, and other things uh, like Oh, you had to, you couldn't have a phone, you couldn't have a computer, you couldn't have a, obviously a television or a radio. And um, I understand that because one of the requirements when someone moves here, and Brian has made noises about doing that, you know, when he retires, he doesn't realize yet that he's not going to be allowed to have any of those things. At least for a while. Because Brian is going to sleep in the Zendo. And Brian is going to have to decide what he really needs, which will fit into a couple of those, I would, I would say a cardboard box, but it could be a cardboard box or one of those. Uh, I had a nun living in the Zendo for two years. She just couldn't get over her attachment, so I just kept her in the Zendo. Uh, and then we have our nice cabin and we have places to stay, but uh, you move into the Zendo because you... Uh, you have the stuff that you need. So what would Brian need? Well, he'd need a pair of work gloves, and he'd need a good coat for the wintertime, and he would need maybe some work boots, 
and he would also need some robes that he would wear all the time and all of that and undergarments and things all of that would fit underneath where he would sleep in this endo and all the extra stuff well he doesn't need fancy clothing 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 to go visit susan if he wants to go visit susan he'll wear his monk's clothes and susan will laugh at him vigorously as he comes through the door <laughs> and susan's going no i won't <laughs> but um that is what I decided a long time ago because people people came here and they, they uh, I had one person came here with a whole truckload of stuff. And I went, what is all of this? Well, this is my stuff. And I go, you got way too much stuff. So this idea of giving up. Well, how does that apply to, because most of the people that practice Buddhism are not monks and nuns. So does that have an application? Well, yeah. I think we want to, to look and see what's important in our life. If we play guitar, like Rob does, his guitar is important. It's kind of hard to play guitar without a guitar. So, uh, but he might want to check out his attachment to guitar. That's very, very difficult, you know, to not be attached to your guitar and still play it. But, uh, you know, how attached are you to Mary? You know, can you be married to Mary without going overboard and looking at her as a possession and simply as uh, this wonderful person that you share your life with? Can you do that? Now, can you apply that to the guitar? Can the guitar be this wonderful thing that you share your life with, but you don't feel ownership of the guitar? Okay, so it's just something to reflect upon. Um, it was brought up that there's a, a Japanese practice center that Americans go to in Los Angeles that um, it's not really a precept. We weren't clear as it was brought up. Bui Mung brought it up because he's been there a lot. Um, but it's a teaching they have. I think we're safe in calling it that, that we should not encourage poverty and should not be interested in living in poverty. And that's that's very interesting because an awful lot of American monks that uh, practice at, at Zen centers have careers. And monks don't typically have careers other than being a monk. You know, Nagachita always talks about this brother of mine in the Dharma who got upset one day and was talking about somebody was messing up his career. Well, I think that's a rather hysterical way of looking at being a monk. You're messing up my career, <laughs> whatever that actually means. But very often writers will talk about monks as having a successful career because they founded a temple, perhaps they trained a number of, of disciples to be good monks and things like that. So we're talking about a career in that sense. But in the Japanese tradition in Japan, uh, many monks have to work. They just don't have any choice because nobody donates any money to support these huge, huge, gorgeous uh, temples, which uh, are just, remember that movie years ago about these people who bought this house and all they did was, they called it like the money hole or something? Money pit. Money pit, money pit yeah. They just kept dropping money in this house and it devoured them. That probably is what the temples in Japan are like because they're so big and at one time many monks lived there and hundreds of people supported the temple and now you have a handful of families who are trying to keep the temple from falling down. And so it's, it's a bit of an understandable thing. I know a couple monks who, uh, one is a principal of an elementary school and another teaches at a girls school and that's the way they have money to live on. So. We come back to this uh, Japanese center in America where they, they have a strong teaching of we do not want to encourage poverty. Poverty is an interesting word. Monks do not suffer from poverty in any country. They suffer from not having stuff. They suffer from non-attachment. But poverty is more than simply you don't own something. Poverty is a state of mind. And if that's what they're trying to teach, I wholeheartedly back it. But if they're saying that uh, we, and this is what Vui Mong said to me, that 
they're encouraging people to have, have uh, some wealth. Uh, how can you help other people if you don't have some wealth? I know a lot of monks that help other people and they're not wealthy because it's an oxymoron to talk about a wealthy monk. It just doesn't make any sense because that monk should be giving away that wealth as fast as he can to people who need to need something, whether it's food or clothing or some place to sleep. So it's a conundrum. And to make things even more complicated, Buddhist monks do not take a, part of a, a vow of poverty. Now, Catholic monks do. They take a vow of poverty, which means that they really only own the robes on their backs. Now, if you go to any typical temple, well, at least uh, other than the Japanese temples, but I have to tell you, here I want to wedge this in. My first teacher, who was Japanese, had nothing. He owned nothing. And I can remember a couple times where we had a new American monk, and he sold him one of his robes. And of course, he said, well, you can, we can order something for Japan, or I had this robe, because he had nothing. And the only money he had for pocket money, and I want you to think about yourself, the only money he had for pocket money was what was left on the altar. And what was left on the altar, if it was $20, that was a really big week. Not a day, a week. Typically we had 10 or $12 that people would leave in the donation box. And that money went to the Roshi. And boy was he rich. I saw him one time at Polly's Pies, and he was a big smile on his face. He was having a cup of coffee and a piece of pie, okay? So he had nothing. Technically, he didn't own the building that the temple was in, okay? He had a car, which I, I'm the one that worked on it and kept it going. We did pay his gas bill, because otherwise he would have been landlocked all the time. Uh, and we paid the utilities. So he had a place to sleep and he had the utilities paid. And uh, Japanese people would come in and bring him food sometimes. And they would invite him to their house sometimes, which is very traditional. Both of those acti activities are very traditional for lay people to either invite the monk to their house for a meal, just read the Pali Sutras. They invited the, the Buddha to their house all the time. Matter of fact, when he got sick and died, he ate a bad meal. It's right there in the sutra that he went there and he ate pig's food and uh, got sick and then had to hold off death until he could talk to his disciples. So that's normal. And of course, donating food, that's normal. Uh, that people bring food to the temple, whether they bring it to an individual monk or they bring it to the temple. Um, that's not wealth. <laughs> that's necessity. You know, there is a necessity called a roof over your head. Can you imagine anybody that came and tried to sleep under one of our trees in the desert, particularly now that we're in the winter? Well, one day Susan would arrive and she would announce that this person was dead and we better call somebody to come get the body. Okay, that's what would happen. So, uh, in India at the time, very temperate. You know, what the monks owned kept them warm. They didn't have a lot of clothing because they didn't need a lot of clothing. It wasn't until they went into the stands like Turkestan and all those places that they had to start wearing coats. And when they got to China, holy mackerel, they got snow on the ground three feet high and all of a sudden they, they had to change the way they dressed. But it was all very, very practical. It had nothing to do with wealth. Typically a monk doesn't have any wealth. He might get a few gifts. Look at these beads. huh? Or the, yeah, anybody get, you don't have, not as big as mine, but that's Bui Mung, you know, he made these beads for me. Someday he's going to come in and they're going to be giant like baseballs or something like that. Then I'm going to have to give them to somebody else. But, you know, usually the robes, we're allowed to have robes, we're allowed to have eating utensils, okay? But if you look at our temple, you go in the kitchen, we got a new hot water thing for making coffee and tea, which a wonderful lady sent to us through Amazon.com because her other one burned up and tried to short out, did short out the circuit. 
And who does that belong to? Well, it belongs to us. It doesn't belong to me. She didn't send it to me. She sent it to the temple. Who does the temple belong to? I had a disciple many years ago that said, oh, you know, you're not going to lose all the equity you have in the property here. And I said, really? <laughs> That's what you think we're doing? As soon as we have an heir apparent, you know, right now it's in my name. As soon as I have an heir apparent, then I will turn it over to our corporation so that uh, that heir apparent can inherit it. Because if the corporation hands it, then he doesn't have to pay inheritance tax. Right, Mary? The it's nonprofit the, owns it. We, the, if the inheritance tax is so high, it wouldn't matter either way right now. <laughs> oh, you mean how much you have to earn? It has to oh. be over 5.43 million. It has to be over 5.43 million to be even be for any taxes to be involved. Oh, state yeah, I, I can remember years ago that was not the case. No, it's true. Yeah. Okay, so this notion of possessions, it's a, it's a huge, huge trap. And... Uh, most of the time, monks can carry in a bag with their possessions. Now, monks that like books like me, we're in trouble. <laughs> you know, but generally speaking, they can carry their possessions in a bag. So, to give up these things is very, very difficult. One of the things that one of the possessions people have that is very difficult to give up is their idea of who they are. And we have many ways we define who we are. And uh, we don't even think about it. Because I had the experience of going into the Army when I was young, uh, I immediately was confronted with a whole bunch of things that defined who I was. One was the clothes I wore. And they gave, us, they gave everybody clothes that looked the same. And that was, uh, wasn't, it wasn't a big problem for me, but it certainly made me aware of how important my surfer guy clothes were that I no longer look like a surfer guy from California. And then they gave us all a haircut. Whoa, that was a little, that was a little tough. Yeah, my little sun-bleached hair was all on the floor. And I looked around and everybody looked identical. And somebody actually asked the question, why? And the guy said, well, now you can stay clean easy. And uh, that really kind of told us what was coming up. <laughs> you know, when he said, yeah, it's easy to stay clean this way. And so we, we really were not allowed to have any personal belongings. And later on, when I got done with all my training, we had a wall locker and we could keep personal belongings. I had a guitar in it, and I had a couple pairs of pants and three shirts and a jacket, so I could go out and pretend I wasn't in the Army, which everybody knew from the haircut. It's like sailors used to come into Long Beach when I was a kid. They thought they were hiding, but they were wearing sailor shoes, right? And uh, nobody else had Hawaiian shirts like they had. You know, nobody could afford them. And so, all of that stuff is our identity. And one of the very hardest things for people to give up is their hair. I had a good friend that uh, went to study with Tian on the same time I did. And when we took the first ordination with Tianan, of course your head gets shaved, but that's universal with all the different traditions in Buddhism. And he had a, a big beard, and he said, do you want to come up so I'm going to shave my beard? <laughs> he says, and he, what he meant was, you want to come up and hold my hand? Because he almost cried as he shaved his beard off. The hair didn't bother him so bad. But boy, shaving that beard off, so much of that was who he was. And we don't think about it until we're confronted with it. Hopefully every two weeks, that was the practice back then. Every couple of weeks, some monks would get some warm water, and at least they'd start off with warm water and a razor, and they'd go and cut their hair and see if they're alive. We have lots of stories about that. The monks living on the side of mountains. Uh, two or three monks would go to check and see if he was alive. If he wasn't alive, they'd bury him. If he was alive, they'd leave some food, a little bag of rice, some veggies, cut his hair, say, are you okay? And if the guy could still answer, 
then they'd go back to the dimple. If you went, uh, 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 uh. then they'd say, okay, come on home. We'll take you back. You're all right. You're with friends. So this giving up who we are, that's the great thing we have to give up. That's the great poverty is so much is invested in our identity. And we don't realize it until it, it's attacked. Someone questions who we are. And then all of a sudden we're in a battle. So the great poverty, if it were to be called a poverty, is to give up who we think we are. And that is the road to freedom. Tanyan Han, when he did his particular translation of the little black book, okay, he gave it a name. It's a pretty good name. My favorite name of all, all Western books, which no longer has that title, is Selling Water by the River by Kenneth Roshi. Hmm. And she turned it into Zen is Eternal Life. What a yuck title. Zen is Eternal Life. How about Selling Water by the River? Does that make you stop and think? How about Stepping into Freedom? That's what Nyad Han called his little book for novice monks. It's a great title. I don't know if he thought of it, but somebody had a great had a, a real uh, genius idea. Let's call the book for new monks stepping into freedom. When we let go of who we think we are, then we're free to be who we are.